Okay, let's uh, let's start. Uh, and Pascal has already started to uh, wish everybody good day. So um, a good day to everybody. And and I really hope that we can uh, get as much out of this really important uh, information session, uh, co-hosted by the Guild of European Research Intensive Universities and the African Research Universities um, Alliance. And um, I want to extend a special wel welcome to uh, Dr. Obed Ogega, who is the Senior Program Officer of the African Academy of Sciences, and who's really um, supporting this uh, this program, uh, and we'll hear from him uh, in, in in a short while. Uh, but first, let me just um, uh, just briefly exp explain the the um, uh, the rationale for this event. Um, the Guild and Arua have uh, had a very strong collaboration since 2018. So the Guild represents 21 research intensive universities in Europe. The African Research Universities Alliance represents uh, 16 research universities in Africa. And we have both come um, together around a shared uh, conviction uh, that our major global challenges can only be addressed in partnership uh, and in a partnership that must extend beyond a single continent. And Africa has got a particular place here because when you think about the future and when you think about our future demographic developments around the world, then Africa clearly is um, the continent uh, where some, where the demographic growth is going to be strongest. And so that it's, it's impossible to imagine that we will uh, em be able to embrace our challenges and overcome our challenges over the next uh, decades uh, without Africa be, being a full partner there. And that works for science and it works for other areas. And so um, we, it, what's important to both organizations is the principle of equity between partners in, in those scientific relationships. And for that, it's really important that the science base, not just of Europe, but also of Africa is, is strengthened. Um, and so we have developed a very um, um, careful list of policy uh, recommendations to policymakers, both in the European Union and uh, in the African Union, to ensure the scientific capacity of Africa and of African universities is enhanced at all levels, whether it's research administration, whether it's PhD students and doctoral programs, whether it's early career scientists, but it uh, or whether it's um, the develop the creation of clusters of excellence um, so that we can uh, really strengthen that research base and and um, ensure that that we can um, address uh, global challenges effectively together and so for, from from that perspective we really welcome the arise uh, pilot program it is still a pilot program but because we are so committed to this uh, point of uh, strengthening research capacities, it's really important to us that the Arise program is a success so that we, we see in the future a, a, a program like the Arise uh, uh, program on a permanent basis, on an annual basis, and on a much bigger scale. But for that, we need to ensure that this first uh, pilot uh, call is, is a success. And I can already see in when we look at the um, the uh, call for applicants uh, that it also uh, there are it's an incredibly impressive um, pilot program. There are a lot of things that we recognize in Europe that are really um, important for outstanding um, uh, frontier research. There is a clear dedication here to groundbreaking science. There's a real commitment here to high risk and high gain uh, research, and um, it's also really notable that just as in Europe. Um, there's all, um, we're now um, developing a much greater um, um, preparedness to ensure that all our publications are open access and that there's a really that there's a genuine gender balance both in the research team but also in the, that we think about gender in the way that we articulate our research questions and challenges and of course again we see that really reflected in the rise call so it's a really phenomenally important call it's a really interesting call um, it's a milestone and and uh, but there is an important policy context to this and for that reason um, I just want to invite Laura Royer who is the C who is a policy officer at the um, guild uh, to just uh, give a very brief outline to the policy context um, uh, th that is also in the Arise uh, program. Laura, the floor is yours. Yeah, okay, good. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Laura Royer, I'm policy officer at the Guild. And um, I will give you now a brief introduction uh, to the policy context around uh, the Arise uh, goal. And um, so the reason why uh, we think it, it, it might be interesting for you to, to discuss the policy context now is that 
uh, you might have seen that the guide for applicants uh, in the guide for applicants that your proposals should be taking into account the priorities of the AU EU uh, high level policy dialogue on science technology um, and innovation. So there is a clear reference uh, to to the policy frame around around the call. And um, but before even going to these specific uh, priorities for science, I just wanted to give you some information on the broader uh, cooperation framework between Africa and Europe to understand a little bit like uh, more also what, where these uh, priorities for science come from. So um, importantly, um, the, the political dialogue between Africa and, and Europe has been uh, framed by a cooperation platform or cooperation framework uh, called the Africa-EU partnership uh, since 2000. And um, in practice, it translates uh, into summits uh, between the EU and the AU to discuss and establish joint political priorities between the two continents. And I'm not going through, I'm not going through now all the history of this Africa-EU partnership, but the most important parts for, for us or for you as, as researchers is probably um, that uh, first of all, in, in 2007, uh, during the second EU Africa summit in Lisbon, um, the, the participants agreed for the publication on the joint Africa EU strategy, uh, which sets out the strategic priorities for the two continents. And in this, in this strategy, which is very broad and encompasses uh, lots of different uh, areas uh, stemming from trade to research, education, and so on, uh, research is really recognized as an engine, as a tool uh, for uh, promoting human and social development, uh, for uh, promoting agriculture and food security, and perhaps the most important, uh, really in the context of this call, call um, the development of, of knowledge-based societies. No? So that was the, the first milestone in a way, uh, which is very important because these are priorities that were jointly agreed between, between the, the two regions. And so that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, the other important thing that you might wish to, to, to know about is that um, during uh, the fifth uh, summit in Abidjan in 2017, um, the, um, the participants agreed to, to really focus the summit on, on youth in a way as a way to, to invest for accelerated uh, growth and sustainable development. And from this summit, a declaration also came out, which also sets out some priorities for AU-EU cooperation. And here again, we have really this focus, this emphasis, no? because it's really the first priority on investing in people. And this investing in people includes education, science, technology, skills development, uh, which is of course very, very much where, where we are um, within the framework of this uh, Arise school. Just, and then uh, finishing this slide, just for, for your information in 2022, so next year, normally there should be the next summit of the, of the EU and AU. And, and from there, there might, uh, be, there might be other, other priorities or at least the, the reaffirmation of, of these priorities that have been uh, discussed previously. So this is for the joint strategies and priorities between the EU and the AU. But they are also unilateral strategies that were published by both sides, so both uh, Europe and, and Africa sides, um, that I would like just to, to touch upon quickly because they, in a way, echo and dialogue uh, with these joint priorities. Very briefly, first of all, um, in 2020, so last year, the European Commission uh, published a communication which was called Towards a Comprehensive Strategy with Africa, which um, in a way is the Commission's vision for the summit that I've just referred to now that will be taking place next year. 
And so in this document, the Commission, the European Commission identifies uh, areas of cooperation. So five areas of cooperation uh, between, between Europe and Africa. And one of these areas of cooperation is um, a partnership for sustainable growth and jobs. So here you see you, you have again this emphasis on, on sustainability um, and on job creation. And within this priority, um, the Commission sets as a goal uh, the, the increased access to, to quality education, skills research, innovation and health and social rights. So this, uh, of course, comes, comes uh, echoes very much the, the, the elements that, that were published before, that were uh, agreed upon before. And on the, on the other side, uh, we have this even much more, more massive and comprehensive document uh, that was published by the AU, so before, uh, in, in 2013. And um, it's called Agenda 2063. You might have heard about it. It's basically the African government's joint uh, vision for the future of the continent, but it's really like uh, looking forward looking to the future, you know, because it's 50 years from here. And one of the goal or one of the agreed goals is um, to build a prosperous Africa, uh, which would be based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. And this will be taking place through the training of uh, well-educated citizens and skills revolution underpinned by science, technology and innovation. So I think what you what you can uh, really remember from this is that from, from the beginning, um, the, the the focus or the way why the way research is embedded into this uh, broader EU Africa partnership uh, is really through like development of sustainable societies and and uh, inclusive growth, sustainable growth. Finally, uh, coming back a little bit more to the, to the specific um, reference that is in the guide for applicants, um, what, I, what I wanted to, to, to tell you briefly is that um, these, these priorities that are outlined in the guide for applicants come from a meeting that took place in 2020 between research and innovation ministers of the EU and the AU. Uh, which took place in the COVID-19 context. So it was very much uh, revol revolving around this uh, question and about how research and innovation can really help uh, overcoming the, the COVID-19 crisis. And during this meeting, they also agreed and identified key areas of research and innovation cooperation between the two continents. So these are the four areas that are um, uh, outlined in the guide for applicants, uh, as you might remember. So there is public health, green transition, innovation and technology, and capacities for science. And capacities for science in particular um, is, is uh, very interesting and is like also a little bit like an umbrella, an umbrella uh, element for, for others that covers, as, as Jan was uh, mentioning just before, open science as, as a priority. Um, developing uh, capacity for science advice for, for policy, um, improving the gender balance uh, in research and innovation, and finally, last but not least, um, human capital development, um, which here again uh, echoes the uh, strategies or the broader strategy that we focus on this um, role of research as a, as a way to, to, to develop uh, sustainable societies you know, and investing, investing in people. And this is, this is the context uh, in which the, the ARISE uh, call was, uh, was uh, developed. But now I think I've, I've already uh, spoken enough of policy. Let's, let's give back the floor uh, to Obed uh, Ogega, who will be uh, giving a, a more detailed presentation on the call. And uh, after we'll be uh, available for to answer uh, the questions you might have. The floor is yours, Robert. Thank you very much, Laura and, and Leon, for uh, that uh, very useful foundation or framework. 
for the presentation today. My work becomes easy now that the policy framework has already been elaborated. And, and um, uh, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. So allow me to share my, uh, my slides. Okay, I hope you can see my slides. Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Obed Ogega. I am a senior programs officer at the African Academy of Sciences, uh, currently leading the team implementing the ARISE grant. Uh, so perhaps just some context so that we get to understand the African Academy of Sciences <clears throat> and the framework or you know the, the, the foundation that then inspires the design of the ARISE call. So the African Academy of Sciences is a uh, upper African non-aligned, non-political, not-for-profit organization headquartered in Nairobi, Kenya, with five regional offices, uh, the one for North Africa being in uh, Egypt, the Western African one being on, in Burkina Faso, Central Africa in, in, in Cameroon, East Africa in Kampala, Uganda, and the Southern African one in Johannesburg, South Africa. So the African Academy of Sciences has uh, three mandates, the first of which is recognizing excellence through fellowships and, and, and other initiatives. The second one is uh, providing advisory and think tank functions. And the third one, where I work, and where the Arise grant is anchored, is on implementing key STI programs. So we, the implementation of the uh, you know, programs and the STI um, agenda uh, is really done through the platform called the Alliance for Accelerating Excellence in Science in Africa, or <clears throat> ISA, that is uh, co-owned by the African Union and, and the African Academy of Sciences. And the vision for the Academy is to see transformed lives. And we do this through leveraging resources, uh, and through research excellence and through leadership, I uh, thought leadership, sorry, for sustainable development. Uh, the African context or the, uh, you know, where we come from, uh, in, in our research context. Climate change is a big issue across Africa. <clears throat> uh, I mean, uh, um, that is not, is, is, is not uh, there's a scientific consensus on climate change and its impact uh, across various sectors, you know, in our economy. Food security or insecurity is also a challenge in the continent, prevailing poverty conditions and high disease burden. Uh, I mean, these are some of the challenges um, that face uh, Africa and, and African researchers in general. So it's against this background that the ISA platform or the African Academy of Sciences uh, five years ago came up with a business plan angered on four goals, the first of which will be to build on research and, uh, you know, RN, research and development leadership and environments that will then support uh, vibrant uh, research ecosystems across our institutions and, and in Africa. The second one will be to support the development of an innovation and science-driven entrepreneurial culture so that uh, you know products from our universities and research institutions then get to the market and ultimately benefit the people for which they are intended. The third goal, and this is where the Arise Grant falls, is really to identify and support rising research leaders to stay and build their careers in Africa. And the fourth and most important uh, for me is targeting critical gaps in the research landscape so that if we do not have enabling environments, then our researchers will be finding it very difficult to successfully implement their research projects in our institutions. And uh, having these goals, uh, you know, for the past five years or so, we've had uh, the privilege of implementing a few programs, some of which may be familiar to you. And I would focus on uh, the rising and emerging leaders uh, strand where the Arise grant is. But basically, these are postdoctoral fellowships, but also uh, research support initiatives for um, early career scientists in general, as we work with them towards being established uh, researchers on the continent. The idea is, Laura talked about the Agenda 2063, the idea is that we need to create a critical mass of uh, research leaders that are then going to provide the scientific evidence that we need in response to Africa's immediate and future 
developmental priorities and challenges. And we are glad that we've been able to do a few, uh, you know, uh, contribute quite a number of uh, cohorts into this critical mass that we talk about uh, over the years. And uh, the Arise grant is a welcome addition to this. And, and we are we looking forward, really looking forward to getting to see the cohort that comes up uh, and, and the interesting projects that they will be implementing as we go forward. Okay, we don't do this alone. We thrive on partnerships, uh, and, and and we really appreciate the support that we get from institutions, you know, regionally or, or even globally that are really working together with the African Academy of Sciences. Even as we um, look forward, you know, we as we strive to, uh, towards achieving the transformation that we need uh, for the continent. Okay, so a bit of a snapshot on where we are or the funding that has been mobilized so far on the continent, 112 million, at least 112 million. The figures may have changed now. I think this was from early in the year, but uh, the last five years or so, an investment of about 112 million dollars has, has, has been made on the African continent on various thematic areas. And the countries marked in blue are those where we have a strong footprint. Uh, this is particularly one of the reasons why in the Arise grant, we made it deliberate, um, uh, you know, we deliberately set out to try and provide at least 40 grants in at least 40 countries so that the, the, the countries in gray uh, get to, that number gets to reduce so that we don't leave anyone behind. I'll be talking about that in a few shortly. So. In terms of the expectations for our research leaders, then there are a few things that we expect our, uh, you know, emerging research leaders to achieve in their fellowships. And the first of which is really the need for these uh, uh, researchers to provide or to um, generate world-class research and innovation. Okay, while our focus in, is is in Africa, the research that is uh, produced from the fellowships that we give must be globally competitive, even as it is uh, locally uh, relevant. The second uh, expectation is that our emerging research leaders should be, uh, you know, prudent financial managers, so to speak, so that they are able to provide that uh, uh, research leadership uh, to the younger generation coming after them. And, and that means they have to be prudent in their finances so that we also have a situation of resource use efficiency for a better or bigger impact. We, even as we expect them to do this, we also expect them to grow and progress in their professional pathways and, and ultimately become the established uh, researchers that they seek to be. We expect them to build networks, you know, intra-Africa collaborations, but also collaborations even outside of the African continent so that there is uh, skills transfer where required and ultimately build ourselves uh, and our research capacity as a continent to address our priorities, like I said, and development challenges. Leadership, among other things, and most importantly, a strong emphasis on uh, community and public engagement and communication, so that our research does not end at uh, our, our libraries and shelves in our research institutions, but that it gets translated and ultimately get to benefit the people uh, for whom the research is, is, is meant. So this brings me, you know, having given you uh, a background or, you know, the synopsis of what really inspired the design of the Arise grant, uh, I'd like to speak a few things or the highlights of the grant. It's still open for applications until 30th of July. I should say that we're doing this in two phases. So the current phase is the expressions of interest or a preliminary application, if you may. Uh, just a few questions that are supposed to help us um, uh, filter applications based on the set eligibility, after which then uh, the qualifying applicants are invited to submit full applications. And the grant is uh, supported you know, generously by the European Commission in the tune of about 25 million uh, euros. And we hope to award up to 500,000 euros to at least 40 independent uh, researchers that then supports their research teams to produce the cutting uh, edge research that we talked about earlier. So the main objective for the Arise grant is to broaden and strengthen Africa's science base 
through open and direct, uh, direct continental competition for funding so that ultimately we contribute to the transformation of Africa into a knowledge-based and innovation-led continent. Okay. Uh, like I said, the target is at least 40 emerging African research leaders across 40 countries, 40 African countries, I should say. And like Laura said, the proposals are open to all African researchers in all areas of scientific endeavor, but reflecting on uh, the priorities of the African Union, European Union High Level Policy Dialogue, STI. Okay. And most importantly, demonstrate the capacity to deliver cutting edge research so that um, it's not enough to just have a research proposal that reflects on these AU, AU uh, priorities. The idea is that it should be, you know, uh, cutting edge research, like I said, globally competitive so that uh, we are able to achieve a bigger impact. And the pilot phase, this grant, like Jon said, is, is a pilot phase. And particularly for this particular grant, we're targeting people that obtained their PhDs at least two years ago and not more than seven years ago, uh, but with their considerable and demonstrable research leadership experience. I know this um, definition can be uh, controversial, but uh, I'll, I'll need us to focus on the definition in the context of the ARISE grant. Um, one other aspect that we really uh, put a lot of emphasis on is the ability of the PI or the applicant to provide research leadership to the teams because we'd require that the PIs engage at least four master's students and at least two PhD students. So that if these postgraduate students are to be mentored and pro provided with that research leadership that we need, then the PI should be uh, able to, you know, should have the capacity to do so. So that's why we need a bit of considerable and demonstrable research leadership experience in addition to just having obtained your PhD, uh, in, you know, for the time period that has been mentioned. And we don't do everything at the African Academy of Sciences alone. We work with others. And among the committees that have been put in place is the Scientific Advisory Committee, which is, com you know, comprised of eminent African and European scientists uh, that then provide that scientific uh, independence and, and leadership on the implementation of the RIS grant. The SAC or the Scientific Advisory Committee will be working with the uh, reviewer panels on thematic areas so that um, ultimately they help, uh, you know, shortlist the best candidates to conduct the best research. So like I said, the RIS grants are, uh, are, are, are implemented in two phases. So the first one, the call, the first part of the call is the expressions of interest, which is still ongoing, been open since 18th of June, and uh, we'll be closing on um, 30th of July. And the, the idea is that after the expressions of interest, uh, qualifying candidates will be invited to submit full applications. The submission will be open for about two months after which an expert review process takes place, including interviews, and uh, eventually, uh, if all goes well, the grants are supposed to begin, the fellowships are supposed to begin in uh, April or May of next year. So I've talked about the Scientific Advisory Committee, which reports to you know, provide support to the African Academy of Sciences implementation team, but also fits into or provides information to the Strategic Steering Committee, uh, which is comprised of representatives from the European Commission, the African Union Commission, and the African Academy of Sciences. So this, like I said again, the independent technical reviewers. So these are, um, uh, you know, uh, reviewers, experts in different fields of research put together according to their thematic areas or their fields of research so that they can provide uh, uh, you know, they can make the reviews and help through the candidate selection process. So uh, I think I'd like to stop there for now and, and, and welcome uh, any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for your listening. Wonderful, Obed. we already have a rich array of questions here. So uh, maybe start with the one that's got the most votes, which is, this, which is from Annalyn. Um, uh, Molotzi, who asked that the core documents say that we need to work out the budget in euros, but the grant portal template is, is in US dollars. So which, what should applicants do? Which is the correct one to use? 
Thank you very much. And my apologies for that. Our system has been very uh, adamant to change to euros, uh, and it still maintains the words USD, even when we required you in the instructions to provide the budget in euros. So please provide the budget in euros, uh, and, and the full applications uh, template will be better than this one. OK, thank, thank you. you. Um, so uh, then the next one is from uh, uh, Amir, who Amir Patel, who asked whether one can apply for, uh, 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 for 300,000 euros for a period of less than three, uh, five years, for instance, for a three-year project. Well, our, the guide for applicants uh, says up to 500,000 and up to five years. So where uh, a particular PI wants to apply for a shorter period for a shorter, you know, a, a small amount of money, they're welcome to submit the applications and then the review committee will make their recommendations based on the information provided. Okay. okay. And uh, can, uh, can masters and PhD bursaries and scholarships be included in the budget? And that the question comes from Dion Miles um, because she says that the guidelines only mention a stipend for research assistants, uh, where it's, and she quotes stipends for the principal investigator and research assistants, i.e. PhD and master students who are part of the principal investigators team. So can PhD bursaries and scholarships be included in the budget? Yes, in, in that guide for applicants, uh, the master students or the postgraduate students, uh, students in general, are referred to as the research assistants uh, so that uh, the PI um, then gets to pay for their stipends. And how you structure the support you give to the postgraduate students is left at the discretion of the, uh, of the PI subject to the provisions of the host institution. We understand that different institutions do things a little differently. Uh, where, whether you want to put their costs as direct research costs or other direct research costs or under personnel costs, that will be uh, at the discretion of the PI. So please work with the grant accountants of your host institution and let them advise you accordingly. But yes, the postgraduate students should be supported through the grant. Okay, and then staying with Dion Miles, who asked another um, popular question where she, where she was really talking about the, the network building in the intra uh, and the intra-African collaborations. Mm -hmm. um, because you say that you want uh, that to, to promote this as a priority, but at the same time, the guidelines say, that, and she quotes again, where cross-country collaborations are established, at least 70% of the research team should be of the same nationality as the host institution. So can you just explain that? that sort of, is there a tension between the, you know, the, the proportion of researchers you want to come from one country, the host country, and the, the intra-African collaborations? Thank you for that question. And it's an, it's a, it's an important question. The, the bottom line is that we are aiming to provide support to at least 40 researchers in at least 40 countries. So if you do a partnership with uh, multiple countries uh, and, and say, for example, you apply as an applicant from Kenya, but your, most of your work will be done, more than 70% of your work will be done outside of Kenya then uh, the, it becomes difficult to quantify or to actually say that that research support was actually given to the researcher in Kenya. So the short answer to your question is, yes, we, we, we encourage intra-Africa or even you know, collaborations outside of the African continent, but provided that the, most of the work that you propose to do is done in the host country. Uh, that you 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 uh, propose to do, and partnerships or collaboration can take you know different forms. It does not mean that, for example, if you are collaborating with a supervisor or a collaborator in in in, in Europe, that uh, you actually uh, provide a budget for that supervisor or collaborator to hire staff that are then going to implement your research from that second institution. So, provided that most of your research work is done at the host institution you know, observing the 70% uh, requirement, uh, you can do collaborations, you know, elsewhere, but make sure that that observation of the 70% requirement is, is, is adhered to. Right. Okay, and then there's a, uh, a question um, that was already voted as a, as a great question, which is that, um, uh, and it's, it's, relation, it's, it's inspired by the UK, um, pulling out some of their international funding. Um, what guarantee do we have that the EU doesn't do the same? Um, and that in a sense, given the amount of money that's at stake, 
uh, researchers will be in year two of the grant, say, will suddenly be high and dry? That is, a, that is a good question, and it's unfortunate that, you know, uh, uh, the, the funding from the, the UK, for example, early this year was a shocker to us. It actually affected the African Academy of Sciences through some of the programs that we implemented. Uh, we cannot be sure of what happens tomorrow. We can only ride on the support that we have today and the commitment, which is a strong commitment from the European Commission, that this money has already been set aside. And, and, and we are confident that we should be able to implement the program to completion as proposed. So while you cannot preempt, you know, cannot preempt exactly what happens tomorrow, what I can, I, can, I can confirm as of now is the commitment that we have from the European Commission uh, to implement the grant as, as, uh, as proposed. We hope nothing disrupts that arrangement so that it goes to completion. I mean, such as life, you can't really be sure about tomorrow. But as of today, it looks good. And Obed, if, if, if I may add to that. So um, the EU is an incredibly complex organization and it takes 27 member states about three years to really agree on a budget over a seven year time frame. So it's very, very complex. But once they have agreed, then in a sense, the time frame for a seven year budget period is set. And that budget period just started in 2021. So so as you said, Obed, it's 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 always, you know, things are always possible in the future, but unlike national governments where budgets are set from one year to the next in the EU, that's not quite the same. I mean, within this seven year framework, there are still annual budgets, but in a sense, we have a little bit more certainty about the budget envelope that the EU has, has to play with over the next seven years than we would have in any national context. So that might be an additional um, piece of information to give you some frame, uh, some, some peace of mind. Thanks, Jan, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, so um, Jan Vermeulen um, asks whether there is a um, somebody uh, he can con contact to assist with the technical issues with, with regard to the online application interface because he's struggling to get his application validated. Yeah, we're happy to assist. So please write to us. I'll text the email address uh, for Arise. So please write to us. We'll be happy to assist. I'll put the email address on the text. Okay, good. So then uh, Samuel uh, Bunani has uh, got a number of questions here. Um, so maybe to start off, um, is there any template of the project proposal in the project submission steps? So it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's a questionnaire. I mean, the, the online submission platform is a questionnaire. So you move from one question to the next. So that will be the template. Mm -hmm. And the eligibility, eligibility criteria of the host institutions are not clear, he says, in the call documents. Do you have any specific specifications for that? Uh, we, we were trying not to be too prescriptive. Uh, so long as this is a, a host institution that has, um, that is a legal entity, is uh, African or based in Africa, and, and, and meets all those eligibility criteria items that have been listed, that host institution should basically qualify but where you are not sure please write to us we, we are happy to clarify because again institutions take different shapes and forms we can't really be too prescriptive about it and in the budget line can you uh, are there salary limits for the personnel to be involved in the project so the the salary or the stipends to be uh, allocated depend on the hr provisions for the host institution so please refer to the HR provisions of the host institutions and work with the grant accountants to help you through that. And in the expression of interest stage, is it necessary to have quotations or offers from, the com from, from companies for expensive equipments that one needs to purchase? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess getting quotations would guide the budgeting. So, I mean, so that you know how much to budget for. Uh, yes, if that helps your application, please, by all means. For us, I should also mention that at this stage, um, we, we are only requesting for a global budget, so to speak. Specifics will be provided in the full applications stage. And therefore documentation will, won't be required now? Now at this point, um, it's enough to submit what, is, what you know, what, what has been asked for in the application platform. But if you want to be practical and you know, get this documentation, that will help. It's, um, it's not a mandatory requirement, but yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Mm. So, so Kim uh, Best has asked whether one has whether one has to supervise two PhDs or four master students uh, uh, during the fellowship, or or how flexible this is. 
the four, at least four master's students and at least two PhD is the minimum that are required to be enrolled in this in this team. You don't have to be the only supervisor. Supervision can be done in many forms, uh, you know, with an arrangement with other collaborators or other supervisors in the host institutions. I mean, we leave that to you so long as, um, apart from the supervision, we expect to, actually this is the, the, the best requirement, that the PI provides uh, research leadership to these, uh, you know, uh, postgraduate students. The idea is that you build their capacity so that tomorrow they're able to apply for grants of their own. So that is the bottom line. In terms of supervision, you can, uh, you know, uh, you, you can do this together with other supervisors in your host institutions, but you have to be part of the team. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, can I, so, so Mohamed Mantala has, has uh, raised a question that, that I, I think one can make a bit more general. So he says, well, he's, he's got his PhD in 2010, does it mean that he's completely out? And I think that raised the question about uh, whether there are exceptions, whether, you know, how you account for people with caring responsibilities or maternity leave or whatever. Are there any, is there any flexibility in this uh, two to seven year requirement? So the two to seven year is the best line, uh, but where, you know, for some reason, someone, for example, like you said, um, took a career break to go and, uh, you know, raise children or maternity leave or things like that. Feel free to submit your application and provide the justification for it. Our review panel will look at the facts uh, or the information provided and make a determination. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so uh, then, uh, sorry. So so um, so should the PI already have masters and PhD students in mind? Should they already be named, or would this can they just indicate how many students they want to educate and then select recruit them later? Well, if you if you are able to do that, please do. <laughs> but then again, remember you don't want to overpromise, and God forbid you don't get a grant. But the idea is that you plan for them. For example, you can say you'd want a student working on a particular objective in your research proposal, and and have the students recruited once you've uh, secured the grant. So it's okay to just say that you would expect a master's student or a PhD student to do specific aspects of the work at the proposal stage. And once granted, then you can do the recruitment. Okay. So mm -hmm. Dion Miles, uh, another set of uh, highly vo uh, voted question. Um, how much should we budget for annual audit costs? Do you have an estimated amount that one should uh, budget per year? And are audit costs encapsulated within G the uh, GFGP assessment or are they separate? That's a good question. Uh, so, I mean, the audit questions will be different from country to country. So this is the part where you consult with your host institution, check with them how much they usually spend on such audits and that way you're able to get a figure. It's precisely for that reason that we didn't give a definite uh, amount to put there. So long as it's, I mean, within practice, please feel free to put that. And the GFGP process, um, if I got the question correctly, it, it shouldn't be part of the audit, really. The GFGP process is, uh, 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 um, is you know, a step that we do before we award. It's a pre-grant award process. So that uh, it then helps us, um, you know, uh, assess the eligibility of the host institutions to host, successfully host and support the implementation of the RISE grant. So that part of the work will be done from our end. We will not require applicants to pay for it. Um, yeah, unless I didn't get that question right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, John van Breda um, asks whether uh, funding will cover any operational research expenses, for instance, for the PhD and master's students that are uh, to do their field research, for instance. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, um, we, if you look at the guide for applicants, we haven't, we haven't predefined how much, what support goes into supporting the postgraduate students. Again, we leave this at the discretion of the PI, but with reference to the HR provisions for the host institution. I'm sure the, every host institution has a procedure on how, um, how to support uh, postgraduate students and the like. So please work with the host institution and see what the provisions are. But ultimately, within the five years plan, you should see uh, the postgraduate students to completion so that you don't start them in year four and, and leave them hanging. 
Okay, thank you. And Hilary uh, uh, Masenda asks, uh, if, if you want to add some pieces of equipment on the budget, um, where is the provision for doing so on the application form? Please say that again, if you want to add. So she says that um, I would like to add some pieces of equipment on my budget, but there's no provision for this on the application form. Uh, yes, and, and this is why I said, as of now, we're only asking for the global budget. So if, uh, you know, the equipment, uh, uh, let's do it this way. Uh, if I were the one applying, I would do a full budget nonetheless, but then have my budget lines grouped into the budget lines that are already provided for in the expressions of interest. So that that gives you the global budget for budget line. Could be, for example, that equipment goes into direct costs, okay, or other research costs. Uh, but then at the full application stage, then you'll be able to provide a detailed budget. Um, yeah, I think well, that's how I would handle it. So Jessica Thorne asked a question that I'm sure is on, on everybody's mind and I'm sure you, you expect it, which is really around the, the, um, the geographical question, mm -hmm. I guess. So she, the specific question is with regard to the requirement of the grant going to 40 countries, if you're a national of a certain country and working in the host institution of another country, what counts? Is it your nationality or that of the host institutions? And, and will you only be selecting one proposal per country? Uh, a, a good and loaded question. and <laughs> it's, it's one that we expect. And um, two things. So first, even when we want to, you know, give at least 40 grants in at least 40 countries, this should not come at the expense of scientific merit. So the first eligibility criteria will be how apt is the proposed research in terms of the scientific merit. So the first eligibility criteria or assessment criteria will be on the scientific merit uh, remit of the proposal. And once that then is done, uh, the reviewers will then now start looking at the geographical representation of the proposals. But if we go through the, you know, we go through the applications and in terms of the scientific merit we only have 20 countries making it to the lim you know the minimum threshold for that scientific merit that we're looking for then we will consider the 20 you know the applications in the 20 countries so while we are being ambitious and and uh, trying to really not leave anyone behind it will not be at the cost of scientific merit so like the second question on, uh, from Jessica on on uh, whether we, we focus on the nationality or, eligible, or the host institution nationality. The answer is that we don't focus on the nationality of the applicant. It is where the research is going to be done. So from experience, we, for example, would have, uh, and sorry to use this example, would have, say, you know, a big number of applicants wanting to go do their research in South Africa, okay? So in that case, if we look at nationalities alone, it will be seen that, Every nationality is, you know, a, a bigger number of countries is represented, but at the end of the day, all the research is done in one country. So that is why in this particular grant, this particular call for applications, we are focused on where the application, where the grant will be implemented rather than the nationality. Yeah. So, so you're really striking to, um, you're trying to strike a fine balance because you, you could, you know, you could see that maybe half of the grants potentially could be done in one country, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you think about just excellence and yeah. you're clearly carefully trying to calibrate this. So, I mean, what will you do? I mean, ultimately, if half of the country, if that is the case and half of the really outstanding projects will be in one country, will that be politically? <laughs> so the, the, the but, I mean, <laughs> this is the challenge with trying to, uh, to strike a balance. Yeah. Yeah. It means that you are going to lose on a few things. But for this particular one, uh, we really want to focus on uh, the scientific excellence, but without leaving anyone behind. Having said that, like I said, if we only get 20 countries meeting that minimum threshold for the scientific uh, criteria, then we stop at that. But because we are aiming to give at least 40 grants, what that means is we go for the first round, uh, not, not in terms of, the, you know, the, the, like I said, the first consideration is uh, scientific merit, so X number of applicants are selected based on that. Then they look at the geographical representation and X number of countries are selected. 
And if by that we don't get the 40 applicants, then we go another round. So it can actually be possible to get more than one grant in one country, depends on the amount of applications that come. But that is not for me, that is for the review panels and the scientific advisory committee. It's only that from the way I see it, that should be the consideration. And just in relation to this, um, uh, Frick, Fikramanamiam uh, Geda is asking whether the PI should only be from Africa. Yes, must be an African national. Yeah. Okay, good. That's that's clear. And um, so, um, can we go back to the, this, the 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 importance of networks? I mean, you made a really mm. strong point about this. And Amir Patel is asking the question about how important inter-African collaboration is, is, but maybe you could, you could just expand the general point about the importance of networks and how applicants might go, go how they might think about these collaborations in, in terms of their grants. I mean, you know, the question of international, you know, extra-African versus African, um, how they might bring those together. Thank you. Uh, it, the idea really is, is, is on leverage, you know, synergies and strengths, um, you know, even within a country, it could be that one university is strong in physical sciences and the other is strong in social sciences or things like that. So if, you know, logically speaking, if you're able to combine synergies, then you stand a better chance of having a bigger, a bigger impact in, in your proposal. So while we, the desire is that we're able to see this intra-Africa collaboration, again, for the spirit of Pan-Africanism, uh, and, and also, you know, collaboration so that we get skills transfer, we get to leverage on our synergies and uh, ultimately stand a better chance of, of having a greater impact, not just on one part of the continent, but, you know, uh, not leaving anyone behind. However, this is not a, a mandatory requirement, okay? We know that um, it's, it's, it's really up to the PI. If they feel there's going to be value addition by collaborating with someone else from another institution, then they're welcome to do so. If not, no one should feel to, to be under obligation to do so. It's, it's closely related to transdisciplinarity versus one or, or a, single, a single discipline in terms of research. So if your proposal be, you know, stands a better chance of benefiting from um, um, synergies from other disciplines of research, you know, could be that you're combining maybe uh, physical, biological, and the other forms of, you know, other fields of research. And you feel it by so doing, you get a bigger impact or, uh, or in, in you make your, your proposal stronger, then you're welcome to do so. But that does not stop someone that wants to focus on their, in, in their own scientific field to, do, to propose from that field alone. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Robert. And, and can I, sorry, can I just come back to the previous issue around nationality and ge geography? Mm -hmm. um, because there's a supplementary question that I should have picked up earlier, which okay. is, um, can a permanent resident who is not an African national, but who is, has an ID and permanent residency in an African country for over five years apply as a PI? This question has been raised a few times. And uh, unfortunately for this particular one, the definition is that you must be an African national. Okay, we hope that in the next uh, phases of our rise, uh, then we'll be able to open it a little more. But for now, unfortunately, we're focusing on African nationals. Thank you. And uh, Leslie Cornish is asking a question. Can somebody with a, who already has an, a, a post in a university uh, take this in addition? So they would, might then not take the sti stipend, but they might use the money for students, for instance. Uh, it's a good question. It's a re it's really good question. So the question is, remember, the grant provides or requires that the PIs uh, commit at least 80% of their full-time equivalent on their RISE grant, okay? So it's up to the PI. If, if you're able to do that, you know, take up other responsibilities uh, uh, or arrangements at the university, but still you know, be able to, to dedicate at least 80% of your time on the grant, then you can do so. Otherwise, what I see happening is that you, you can um, request your university to give you protected time to conduct or to implement the Arise grant, and then have them hire someone, could be a temporary staff or something, to take off the load, the workload that you'd otherwise be implementing if, if you are a full-time employee. So that that way you buy, so to speak, you buy your protected time to conduct the RIS grant. But 
the requirement, the, you know, the 80% minimum time commitment on the grant is a serious requirement. And everyone will have to, sh to show that. The, there is a question um, that um, adding up salary costs and funding for students results in a budget overshooting uh, the amount of the grant. So that would leave very little support for, for the project running costs. So can one apply, um, and it goes back to this question, can one apply for the full award, uh, but over, two, uh, over three years? But I guess you, you already answered that to some extent, right? Yeah, I think I did that already. So basically, maybe a quick, a quick addition to that is the students, the postgraduate students should not be seen as a burden really. It's, it's part of the design of the grant so that there is capacity building. Uh, remember not everyone can get a grant, but we are looking at if you add U plus four master students and two PhDs, that's a team of at least seven that are working in this research project. So uh, that already should be, you know, uh, should be a vibrant research uh, unit if you are in a department, for example. So look at this, don't look at, at the postgraduate students as just research assistants, but potential people that are going to help you even become a senior researcher, because as you become a senior researcher, there are junior researchers that are coming behind you and together, then you're able to have a, a vibrant ecosystem. But like I said, the grant is up to 500,000. How you distribute that really depends on what you're proposing to do. So long as all the aspects of the grant, including capacity building for the students are catered for. If you can do that in three years, please request for three years. Otherwise you have up to five years. Wonderful. And there's a great question here also about um, in terms of research leadership. I mean, you mentioned that in your, in your presentation that research leadership mm. is really important. What qualifies as evidence of research leadership? Ah, it's a good question. Thank you. Uh, so having a, a postdoc fellowship program, for example, or having gone through a postdoctoral fellowship alone, um, may not provide you with that research leadership that we're talking about. So it's a collection of things, experiences, qualifications, that together then uh, define your ability as a PI to provide that leadership to the students. So obviously publications um, come in handy <coughs> if you've been able to publish significantly, because ultimately one of the outputs of this grant is that you're able to publish. Your students are able to begin to publish things uh, through your, your, your leadership. So in addition to just, uh, you know, some universities, for example, can employ you directly as a, re a lecturer without requiring you to have had a postdoctoral fellowship. Some universities require that you, become, you, you can only join as a postdoc fellow, okay? So we are leaving that criteria open based on uh, your situation or the host institution where you best put together a statement that quantifies what you consider as your uh, research leadership experience. If it's publications that you think um, would give you that definition, then please do. But if you've not done as many publications, but you've supervised X number of students, you've been able to do, to teach, you know, X number of units for X number of years, then put that together and package it. And, and so that it uh, defines what, what your research leadership experience is. Can we just go back to something you mentioned earlier, um, Obed, which is the, the four masters and two PhD as a minimum requirement. Nick Simpson writes that um, in the guidelines, it says can recruit, coordinate and supervise a research team composed of indicatively two PhDs and four master students, depending on the requirements of the research field. So he says that's not that to him doesn't read like it's a requirement. It, it's can recruit. It's, op, it's, 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 a, it's a suggestion. But you, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier that that was a kind of minimum threshold. Yeah, um, I'm not sure which part of the guide for applicants is referring to. Uh, I'm trying to, but the best, the bottom line is you need to, the, the PI should have at least four master students and at least two PhD. Actually, there's a threshold. You, you can't even, you can't hire 20, for example. I'm trying to, Look for the exact text for that. Um, just one second, let me refer to it so that we are on the same page. Yeah, if you go to page six, uh, page six at the top, 
And this is uh, talking about the eligibility of the principal investigator. So please, if you read that thing in, full, in uh, not just in, in isolation. So one of the, the uh, one of the eligibility criterion for a PI, an eligible PI is that they can recruit, okay? And coordinate and co-supervise. So recruitment, coordination, and co-supervision of a research team should be read in the same sentence. And then uh, two PhD and four master students, depending on the requirements of the field. Uh, additional students could be considered on duly justified reasons, clearly explained in the grant application with a maximum of four PhD and eight master's students. So I can, we can look again where this is mentioned, but the bottom line is you, every, PI should recruit at least four master's students and at least two PhD students. So we can say two to four PhD students and four to eight master's students, depending on the grant, the, the, the proposal that is being uh, submitted. Uh, I hope that does not cause more confusion than clarity. Uh, okay. But I'm able to, I'm, I'm happy to elaborate. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, but there are two questions from uh, participants about whether a partner from the EU is required, and presumably the answer is no, right? A partner from the EU, again, like I said, without defining what that partnership should look like, yes, there is that possibility. You, 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 you are welcome to form partnerships within Africa or you know, even outside of Africa, so long as, like we said, the 70% requirement, but also if, for example, you want to go do some of your work in Europe or the US or wherever, so long as cumulatively you don't spend more than six months outside of your host institution, okay? So you can have partnerships, you know. Uh, you can, but you don't have to, you don't have to. Uh, have it's it's not a mandatory requirement, no. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. And um, can I ask you about the, um, the question, so there is a, um, you know, applicants can include information on open access, gender balance, ethical principles and research integrity. Could they cost in um, uh, open access publication in hybrid journals? And if so, how do they do this? Yes, so when you're in, in your budgets as a, as, as a PI, uh, you know how many publications you want to do. So when you're doing budgeting for APCs, article processing charges, uh, you should put a budget that reflects open access publications. Uh, apart from that, you will also have access to the AS Open Access Publishing Platform, which is uh, an immediate publication platform for all your journal articles. But you are not under obligation to publish there in this particular platform. It's only that it's available for you. So in addition to the AS Open Access, you can also uh, budget for it in your, in, in your budget. Mm -hmm. And and just going back to the 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 tricky question of the the um, the seventy percent of the research team that you just mentioned again. So Hannah Muzi asks, um, uh, if I am from one African country, but based and applying to to perform the research conduct the research in another African country, mm -hmm. how does the seventy rule apply? The seventy percent of the research team rule apply. In that so case? in principle, remember where your host institution is that is where the 70% uh, requirement applies. So that um, the research assistants, the masters or the, the postgraduate students, the technical team have to be, uh, the same, have to have the same nationality as the host institution. Yeah, so I hope that's understood. Yeah. Um, we, we've had here a really good example, maybe to come back to the question of, of career breaks. So uh, mm -hmm. from an anonymous at attendee who says, I did my PhD in 2012, but then had two years of a career break. Um, am I, uh, do I qualify? Presumably that takes us right up until 2021, right? <laughs> so like I said, the best requirement is that you, the PI, um, should have completed their PhD two years ago and not longer than seven years ago, inclusive. However, where a career break happened for a justifiable reason, applicants that are outside that threshold can apply but provide the justification. And then the reviewer, the, the review committees will make a determination on whether that should be allowed or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if one is, um, again, about the eligibility requirements, so if one um, is completing a PhD in 2021, but has been teaching at a university already for five years, does that qualify? 
now, unfortunately. The two to seven is, is really a strong requirement. And um, uh, yeah, we, we expect you to have completed the PhD at the, point, uh, the time of application. I should also jump in at this stage and say that medical doctors, if they don't have a PhD, also don't qualify. So I've had a few questions um, from other fora where someone asks, this is, uh, they've been a medical doctor, and they've been doing this and that, uh, uh, do they qualify? So unfortunately, in this context, they don't. Right. So the requirement for a PhD is really a strong requirement. Mm -hmm. And uh, just going back to the, um, the institutional collaborations, um, we've talked about a lot about networks across Africa and, and beyond Africa. Beyond, what yeah. about uh, institutional collaborations within a single host country? Is that allowed, encouraged? Absolutely. Like I said, we don't define where the, the collaborations come from. It's up to you as the PI, depending on what you are proposed to do. So please, by all means. Um, can you change the PI after, after winning the grant? No. The PI is part of the proposal. So is the host institution. So all these things are considered in context, in, you know, together. Um, you can't, for example, outsource your grant to someone else. Okay, so um, given that the priority is to have researchers work within, within the country of their host countries, how will work spanning multiple, multiple countries be supported? So, um, you know, um, projects that don't necessarily have a particularly strong focus in one country, but uh, across an entire region. So it's, it's up to you as the PI really. I mean, you know the requirement, the provisions for the call. So even as you design your research proposal, please uh, have in mind the context against which you're proposing. Uh, it will be interesting. We'll be interesting to see, we'll be interested to see how you're able to navigate that space. Uh, so I would say uh, as an example, uh, you know, could be that a project is supposed to be, is proposed to be implemented in Kenya. So you have your team uh, at a Kenyan host institution, but you're doing some dissemination activities in Uganda or Tanzania or another country or something like that. So in that case, the program implementation team is or meets the 70% threshold, but the field work activities or you know, dissemination activities can, can be done elsewhere without necessarily having to go set up a team in the other country where your, your project is, is being implemented. So again, you know the framework, you know the provisions of the grant, the, the, the call for applications, design your research proposals to adhere to the provisions. There's a question here about, uh, that says, what is the cut of age for the application? I presume that means whether there's an age limit somewhere. The chronological age, like how old someone is? No, we, we're not focusing on that. We are focused on the amount of time after your PhD. Right. And are there any conditions or requirements for a co-principal in uh, investigator, or is it possible to have two principal investigators? No, one one principal investigator, please. Um, uh, if if you need to have additional support in terms of you know re your research team, have them um, you know as collaborators or research or researchers or research assistants, whichever form that takes. But it's only one applicant at a time. Right. And um, there is a question that takes us back to the political sort of frame of this, um, mm -hmm. which is um, how close must proposals align with the US, uh, with the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals? Well, that is part of the novelty and creativity that we need to see in the proposals. I mean, these are global, regional, local frameworks against which, you know, research or development is actually supposed to be done. So, when you propose as a researcher, you should be having these frameworks and uh, development blueprints really somewhere in the back of your mind. But there is no specific requirements on how the alignment is supposed to be done. So the minimum provision is, for example, that uh, your proposals reflect on, while they are open from all fields of research, they should reflect on the, the AU EU high policy on STI. Okay, but that does not even define exactly what that looks like. So you need to be, this is the novelty, this is the creativity, this is what sets aside proposals. So in your own way of looking at things. But I should also mention that leaving these things open means that we really are interested in seeing what is out there. So instead of predefining things, 
uh, which puts at a risk of missing out a few um, innovative ideas out there. Uh, we, we leave it open like this, especially for, especially for this pilot program, so that the PIs, the creativity, the innovation of, of, of the PIs is, is able to take the center stage rather than uh, what we want to achieve. Okay. Um, so, so um, I mean, just, just, just on that. So, for instance, when you are talking about the, um, uh, you know, the capacities for science, and and we've 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 discussed, we've seen earlier how um, originally in these, um, in the way that was considered, um, the the policy, the AU EU policy dialogue really envisaged human capital development. Um, then, then you would encourage researchers to really think through how their work can do that, or you know, can 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 subscribe you would encourage them to just um, articulate themselves how their work could 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 achieve that without being too narrow on, on these objectives. Well, remember the main objective of the Arise grant is to broaden and strengthen African science base that would then contribute to the transformation of Africa into a knowledge-based and innovation-led continent. What this means is you want to see transformed lives through science. How you want to do that? This is the innovation that we're talking about. So based on this general objective of the Arise grant, we leave it at the discretion of the PIs or the applicants to really define their understanding. What in their understanding and consideration would be uh, an ideal proposal to really respond to this main objective. Okay, great, that's, that's very clear. Um, uh, Odiril uh, Silamana is asking what uh, if there's a recommended percentage or an ideal percentage about the share of the total cost that might be made um, uh, of the personal personnel cost. I mean, is there is an is there an ideal personnel cost that you have? Could it be fifty percent of the budget, or you know, of course, taking into uh, into into account the institutional requirements for different levels? So, so we. In the guide for applications, we've given reference to the AS cost guidelines policy. So that should give you a general idea uh, of what the provisions in different uh, uh, budget lines should be like. And but having said that, we we didn't want to be to to, to be too descriptive again. So refer to the AS cost guidelines as a general guide in terms of what the number should look like, but work closely with your host institution. Though.